So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this keynote session. Uh, my name is Tamim Aspua, and uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to share uh, this session uh, of our speaker, uh, Professor Aishi Yoshida. Um, Professor Yoshida um, um, studied uh, in Japan at the University of Tokyo, received his master degree and PhD degree. And he then uh, joined what's known today as the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, AIST, in Japan, where um, he was working in a team on humanoid robotics, in particular in the context of the uh, humanoid robotic project in Japan, the HRP robots, which all of you or humanoid robotics friends know very well. Um, he also served actually on international level um, and was co-director of the joint robotics lab between AIST and CNRS uh, in France. So he was the co-director of this joint lab from 2004 to 2008. And he was also director of the Industrial Cyberphysical Systems Research Center um, and Cooperative Research Laboratory for Advanced Logistics at AIST in Japan in, from 2020 to 21. Since few months, actually recently, this year, he joined the Tokyo University of Science as full professor at the Department of Appl Applied Electronics, Faculty of Advanced Engineering. Um, in his career, he was visiting professor, for example, at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and at the University uh, of Tsukuba. Aishi is IEEE fellow and member of several um, organizations like the uh, Robotic Society of Japan. He published more than 200 scientific publications in journals and peer-reviewed international conferences and received several best paper awards. Also, among others, also the very prestigious um, National Order of Merit of the French government. Um, he is active in his service for the uh, society and for our community, so he is senior editor of the IEEE Transactions of Robotics and acted as associate editor and editor for several of our flagship conferences like the ICRA, IROS, and Humanoids. Um, his research interests are task planning and motion planning for humanoid robotics, uh, while putting actually the human in the center, where he worked on modeling humans on the transfer of um, research in humanoid robotics to different assistive technologies, but also transfer uh, to advanced logistic technology. And today he is going to tell us um, about the transformative impact of robotics actually to, to cyber physical twins for understanding and synthesizing uh, human behaviors. Aishi, thanks for being here and we are very much looking forward to your presentation, please. Thank you very much, Tamim, for a very uh, kind introduction. So I'm very uh, pleased to be here to talk about this topic. So actually, um, <coughs> this is the first time uh, to be in an in-person conference for uh, first time in the, in the three, since three, uh, since three years ago. So I think I'm very excited to have you all here. Especially, I heard that uh, half of the participants are the newcomers to ICRA. So I think this shows that this the uh, bright future of this robotics field. And I think, uh, I hope some of you uh, become interested in, in uh, for example, the human robotics and also some research related in human. So uh, I'd like to start the, my talk. <coughs> so uh, I have been in uh, human robotics research for a while. Um, the whole body humanoid, uh, its platform 
uh, dated from the late uh, 90s. And uh, there are several uh, very nice platforms like Honda, Waseda, and also uh, I think the uh, Tamim is one of the uh, <coughs> fascinated researcher of humanoids, so I put it Lama <laughs> here. So many, and also this is the Toro and everything, especially uh, also the uh, AIC, some, uh, some platforms AIC. And now, uh, as you can see, the, <coughs> the robots from both dynamics, they are making amazing, amazing movement. So uh, I'm very fascinated in this domain. And of course, uh, I have been also involved um, several book editing. So for example, starting from the motion planning for human robots, like <coughs> the show here, like shown here, and also some handbooks, and also some dedicated uh, reference on humanoids. So uh, if you're interested in this uh, research field, please take those books to start kind of uh, familiarize with this uh, fascinating research field. So uh, human robots, so of course, uh, it's still uh, under development, and uh, <coughs> we can see some industrial applications like heavy duty tasks in very uh, hostile environment, also um, repetitive tasks in um, <coughs> confined spaces like uh, in uh, uh, airplane assembly in li like uh, this is a kind of uh, large scale assembly. And also I saw uh, Digit is working around here and it can be also used for industry. So it can be the human robot in, in industry can respond, for example, the uh, problem of labor shortage. But also uh, maybe why many researchers are also interested in human robots is I think it is an excellent tool uh, for uh, in, uh, research into human. So if you are uh, uh, working on humanoids, you are more and more uh, amazed by the, <coughs> the excellence of human. So it can be used, for example, as a platform for um, human, physical human-robot interaction, and also some cognitive aspects of humanoid, human. And also, as I will talk later, uh, it can be used, for example, to evaluate or as, uh, assess the products uh, designed for human, like <coughs> uh, <coughs> by imitating or reproducing the human behavior. So, and then by adding a uh, digital actor, the human, uh, human model, to this humanoid research, it, its value can be more, even more uh, <coughs> important, I think. So uh, what I call here uh, cyber physical twin is that there's some integrated framework to uh, understand human and also uh, to <coughs> synthesize or predict human behavior. Of course, human is the target and the reference uh, model of these motions and the behaviors, but uh, unfortunately, it is still difficult to, for example, to uh, measure everything uh, in <coughs> internal states of of uh, <coughs> its model uh, of human. Then uh, humanoid can be very useful as a physical twin. And then uh, if uh, human, humanoid behaves like human, you can uh, measure internal state, like uh, joint angle or joint torque. But uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, have uh <coughs> many number of humanoids to, by changing its dimensions. So uh, now a digital twin is another advantage um, because we can change the settings, the size and the height, for example, uh, weight. Even uh, we can add age, as I uh, talk later, as a parameter to model different shapes of human. So uh, by using, by combining them in a complementary manner like this, uh, <coughs> we can uh, make a profound research on into human and also uh, by based on the technology of robotics. And then uh, <coughs> I hope also it can serve to, uh, to provide some data to understand humans and also um <coughs> different types of applications. And then uh, basic theory and uh, basic theory like optimization is also uh, very important to support those uh, <coughs> different types of platforms. So uh, in this talk, uh, I, I, I will uh, mention several uh, aspects. And also, this is a model-based framework. 
So I know that there are many, many researches on uh, learning, but we are uh, still a lot of things to do, uh, model-based things. So this, uh, I, I talk about uh, cyber physical twins for human modeling. Uh, first, uh, physical reproduction of human motions and its application for wearable robot evaluation. And then, uh, <coughs> uh, digital actor and simulation, motion synthesis, and maybe at the, at the last, uh, some uh, extension, uh, ongoing project, uh, to uh, combine them with some learning uh, technology. So now I start with the physical reproduction. So uh, <coughs> by using optimization program uh, 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 technology, we can uh, combine, uh <coughs> we can uh, reinforce the human model by, by, by better <coughs> for, for better performance. In physical space, you measure human motion, and then you can reproduce it in the cyberspace or simulate by the human robot. And then uh, this model can be e improved uh, by a <coughs> data simulation technology, and also some validation with the real world. By using this, uh, you can have a better and precise, more precise model of human, like a musculoskeletal model. So I have, I, I have been involved in a national project called Robotics Devices for Nursing Care Project. So uh, <coughs> this is uh, to uh, provide more autonomy with um, the people and also reduce the burden for the caregivers. So the most of the uh, funding goes to the, went to the company who developed uh, those uh, devices in this area. And uh, my former uh, institute, AIST, uh, joined this project to establish assessment protocol to ensure safety and also ethical uh, uh, <coughs> requirements. So this is one example of usage of human robot. So uh, <coughs> how can human how can be human humanoid useful for this kind of evaluation? So this is one uh, example. Um, so uh, this here, this is a uh, suit, smart, what we call smart suit. Uh, this this suit had the elastic band on the back side of the in the inside the suit, and then when you bend down, it stretches and it generates a force to support your upper body to reduce your <coughs> the load at the lower back. So uh, by reproducing, for example, the lifting motion of human, human by human robot like this, so uh, we can measure the force uh, generated by this uh, device, the, uh, by this suit. So when you uh, evaluate this kind of uh, suit, um, <coughs> it is very difficult to evaluate really in, in a quantitative manner, but by using uh, human robot, for example, you can use the sensors inside the human, humanoid, to measure, for example, the, what is the supportive torque. This is one example. And then, uh, humanoid doesn't really uh, complain if you ask him to re uh, repeat 20 times the same, same motion, and but uh, on the other side, we can improve the precision. So, and then, of, of if this kind of uh, evaluation process can be approved. Uh, <coughs> also, the very heavy ethical process can be also uh, <coughs> lightened. So the, uh, we have been working on this human motion reproduction, uh, principally with Professor uh, Dr. Ayusawa. So this is uh, what we call retargeting. Retargeting is a very common uh, technology in the graphics to uh, reproduce human motion into, for example, the graphic, graphic uh, digital actor. So we have several uh, functions <coughs> to, uh, to uh, optimize. First, the human uh, motion recon reconstruction. So we have the another human model, and then um, to uh, uh, model the human body itself, uh, we introduce the, um, virtual, the virtual joints to, for example, absorb, absorb the difference uh, between uh, the, <coughs> the robot body and also human body. And then, uh, of course, we need to introduce, integrate, integrate the uh, constraints, physical constraints, like uh, 
uh, GMP or uh, balance and also some joint constraints. So by uh, applying the simultaneous optimization, uh, we can um, reproduce the human motion um, <coughs> by preserving the original uh, features. For example, we measure this kind of motion and then uh, we produce it by human robot like this. And at the same time, uh, we can obtain the human motion with the robot constraint, which means that what, what could be the motion, uh, human motion, if your body is like robot, if your body has a uh, robot uh, constraint. This shows some what kind of classes can be well evaluated by the human robot. So <coughs> then uh, we apply this uh, te technique to d different types of motion. Uh, lifting or some displacing uh, object and also some transferring uh, <coughs> some person like this. So as you can see, uh, even though uh, there is some uh <coughs> slowdown of the motion, uh, you can see that the robot can uh, uh, reproduce the <coughs> typical human motions like this. So since until now, uh, this is a uh, reproduction of uh, motion without changing of feet, change of the feet. So uh, we have extended by <coughs> adding, stepping, uh, what, what we call uh, working pattern generator and apply the, uh, <coughs> apply the uh, retargeting technology. So uh, this is kind of uh, uh, simulated, emulated uh, installation motion, including stepping. So a bit, it, it, it looks like a bit robot. It's not just like normal walking. And then by applying the same technology, we can also reproduce this kind of motion. So for example, uh, it can be used to really, uh, what could be the, for example, the, <coughs> the force or uh, uh, torques applied when you are doing this kind of very uh, uh, task in the very uncomfortable uh, posture. So, uh, so far, so the robot, the humanoid, uh, we play the measured motion trajectory. But if we want to evaluate more powerful uh, device like this, this uh, is called muscle suit. Uh, this is uh, developed in Japan, and uh, it produces very powerful torque by using pneumatic actuator. So to, for example, <coughs> ask you uh, to allow you to lift, for example, 30 kilograms of weight. But if uh, we apply the same method to this uh, device, uh, not uh, uh, if we just reproduce the trajectory, um, <coughs> not only the it is not well uh, time, uh, uh, synchronized, but also it could uh, harm or break the robot. So we introduced um, Broke-based uh, interact, uh, interactive trajectory tracking control. So you measure uh, the lifting motion like this. Uh, it is the same, but then uh, you apply uh, this method. So when your external force is applied, it triggers the uh, lifting motion, and then you record the joint angle and torque, and then you play the motion without the device and then compare. So uh, in this graph, for example, if in the lower side, it says your, your, your load is very heavy and upper side, so it is uh, reduced. So you can see that this uh, powerful device can uh, generate several uh, tens of Newton meter to help you lift heavy objects. So uh, there's always question about the difference between human and robot. So sometimes, in, in this case, we try to uh, relate human measurements to the robot constant retargeting. So we measured the EMG of lifting, the human lifting heavy object. And then um, when, hu when the human wears the <coughs> this uh, powerful as as assistive device, uh, we see that um <coughs> the human also makes the maximum of the external force to reduce its own power, which means that we can also compute and compare equivalent torques uh, by 
also using uh, by also measuring this kind of uh, EMG. So uh, one application of this uh, uh, work is the standardization for a collaborating wearable wear assistive robot. So uh, in Japan, at least there are several uh, devices already commercialized in and uh, put into market. This is the one, one, one is Cyberdyne, and the other is the other uh, you know this the, the muscle suit, and also another one. So we uh, applied our retargeting technology for to <coughs> uh, set up a standard for these devices. So we just uh, make a, a mock-up that has two degrees of freedom, the hip and the knee, and then uh, tries to uh, <coughs> evaluate this, these devices. You know, uh, it, this mock-up can also wear uh, these devices without any modification like human wear. And then we model the lifting motion by polyno polynomial function, and it can be also, it, the, the retargeting, retargeting technology can be also used here and we can see that we can uh, found that we found that the uh, combined motion with hip and knee can be uh, described a few very few number of parameters, and then uh, it really fits the actual uh, lifting uh, trajectory of human. So this is an example. Uh, so th there are different uh, types of device, such devices like, uh, for example, the muscle suits. It is you who start using by using, uh, for example, by your <coughs> putting your breath, and others have, has, have sensors, and then to trigger the start the lifting motion. So this is uh, the test with the, this HAL, Cyberdyne HAL uh, device. So we, co we measure the, the torques and also the force applied by the, the force, center, force center here, how many forces are presses your the lumbar disc. So we have two kinds of uh, measures here. The first is how much <coughs> um, torque is applied to help your motion, and the other is how much the pressure at the, at the lower back is reduced. So uh, we provide this kind of measures, and then with different timings. So we to, uh, to allow you to uh, uh, correctly uh, evaluate uh, what what <coughs> what is the good point of these devices? For example, when you this this is not to compare uh, which is better than other. This is to uh, help user to to make their choice according to their uh, need. For example, when you buy a car, you may have a very powerful car, or you may be, uh, you may want to have a very efficient car. So this is to uh, help users to choose their uh, product. So uh, so far. Uh, there have been uh, standards only for the safety for this kind of robot. And then uh, we, by this research, uh, we set up the world first uh, standard on the safety and performance uh, and physical assistance, performance of the physical uh, assistance robot. So first we start with the Japanese uh, industry standard called this, and then uh, by uh, a tremendous efforts of Dr. Nabeshima. Now it is also integrated in ISO, uh, <coughs> also also the performance and serv performance for a service robot. I think uh, one this is one of the example that human robot can uh, serve to the some some kind of inside of the benefit of society. So now I move to the digital actor. So uh, the uh, the good point of the digital actor is you can change the, fa the, the shape according to different parameters. So of course you can think about the ch changing the height or weight, and then we added age here. So fortunately we had a, a database of uh, shape of the peop <coughs> elderly people. So unfortunately if you get older, uh, you are losing the, some capacity to keep your body in shape. So it's uh, you, you start losing against the, the gravity. So um, then we integrated it in the also the as a parameter. So if you change the age, so you can change the shape. And then this is kind of principal principal component analysis. 
And then you also you can change the shape of the this human by changing height and weight. So uh, by also combining the uh, some diff surface deformation model, when you change the posture, so you also blend the surface to so that it could be uh, it can be um, plausible, and then apply some simulation dynamic simulation by using the skeleton model and the, the skinning and also uh, mapping of the external force to the joint. So we applied this uh, this human technique to also evaluate how much forces are applied to the human when we're using uh, this kind of uh, transfer uh, device. This is uh, using by some sheet. And then uh, we compare with the force distribution uh, by using <coughs> this simulation. So and then we can uh, match the parameter. And then uh, we, we show that uh, it can be very well modeled. So, uh, and then you can change the parameter of the digital actor to evaluate what can be what uh, what, we, what is the comfort uh, of <coughs> this uh, when you use this kind of devices. Another example is a mildly assisting wearable robot. So uh, recently, uh, in parallel with the, the very powerful uh, device, but also um, some mildly assisting device that's also uh, becoming available. So these are some examples uh, <coughs> developed in US. So uh, in Japan also a company develops a uh, device using some wire. So this is also lightweight uh, device um, to uh, support your walking. And then we uh, measured, uh, also make, we did some human measurements and uh, by changing the, for example, the, 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 <coughs> the tension, by the tension, and then applied uh, the, this, uh, uh, this uh, human actor uh, analysis. And also we use the, the uh, shape and then uh, also compute the uh, contact force. And then uh, you can also uh, estimate, for example, how much torque is generated by <coughs> this surface. So we, we saw that at the beginning of the, this support, it, it can help uh, uh, moving your leg to, uh, to, to walking more, to make the walking uh, easier. The final example of the design of the living space. So this is uh, in the restroom, so everyone uses it every, every day. Uh, if you uh, also have some problem with your knee, so we say that the huge uh, torque is applied at your knee, at your knees. And then, <coughs> so if you uh, stand up without anything, so it's a very strong, so it's a wet. And then, uh, sorry. <coughs> the straight idea is to put handrail in the, in, the, in the restroom, but some people doesn't like it, some people don't like it in appearance or aesthetic reason. But if you put small shell on the side, it can, generate, it can uh, produce the same effect, which means that it, it allows you some another choice of the designing the living space. Okay, so I move to the uh, motion analysis and synthesis. Um, so uh, inside the human, so Till now, it was the outside, the shape of the, and then uh, analysis, uh, analysis of digital actor, but also um, professor uh, initiated by Professor Nakamura. Um, <coughs> now the muscular skeletal model an analysis is very advanced. So this is uh, to estimate the muscle activity. You have hundreds of uh, muscles in your body. So it, it is very difficult to uh, estimate for each one, but by applying the optimi optimization technology, so minimizing wire tension, and also uh, minimizing the error from the motion model, we can estimate the activities of each muscle in this way. So this is kind of also application of the robot, uh, dynamic theory of the robot.
So uh, with <coughs> my colleague, colleagues, we extended this uh, analysis to estimate the joint reaction force, not only the mass activity. So we, apply, we added uh, another uh, criteria to evaluate the joint reaction force. And this is the force uh, generated by your mass activity, so the force, for example, pressure for, uh, the force pressure at uh, <coughs> your, for example, lumbar disc. So, um, and then uh, also there is a strong uh, constraint of muscles that doesn't, muscles uh, don't generate uh, ex extension force. And then uh, we developed a real-time estimation of this uh, joint reaction force, in this case, at the lower back, the lumbar disc. So uh, by using motion capture system, you can estimate the uh, force applied at the lower back, and then you can see that if uh, your uh, <coughs> uh, lower back has a force exceeding some thresholds, it can give some warning. So this can be used for uh, monitoring. So this is by uh, using the optical motion capture system. So it has very limited volume of measurements. So uh, we apply, we extended it with the uh, IMU. There's also IMU-based motion capture system. So this is also a real-time analysis of uh, mass activities and the joint reaction force. So by using this, <coughs> you can uh, estimate the mass activities in inside your body. And you can choose any kind of uh, muscles to, to monitor. And another extension is to combine different uh, sources of the motion measurements, uh, optical uh, image, and also uh, IMU. So uh, this is combined the, the, to, to do some precise measurement. So of course, um, if you're doing with the digital uh, uh, optical uh, measurements, it's fine, but sometimes it, uh, you have occlusion. So then uh, we make use of the inertial sensor to continue measurements and then uh, to also uh, maintain certain amount, certain level of the precision. And then uh, we e combine it also some localization technique so to uh, <coughs> monitor human activities in the wider area. So by using um, beacons and also uh, what we call pedest uh, pedestrian gate reckoning system. You know that um <coughs> by uh, adding, uh, by, using, by combining those, uh, those sensors, you can um, may, uh, monitor the human activities. It's not just watch you uh, all the time, but to try to, to, to try to identify, for example, what is the most uh, painful task, for example, and to improve the environment. So there are, uh, we can uh, continuously measure uh, follows. And uh, for example, you can go up the stairs. Sorry, so the, the, <coughs> the right hand, Right hand side image, it doesn't have any uh, image of the stairs, but <coughs> it's, continue, it's continuing. And for example, <coughs> you can also um, monitor another thing. So maybe you can guess what he's doing. He's just uh, erasing the whiteboard. <coughs> so, okay, so uh, this kind of thing uh, it can be useful to monitor the human activities. So, um, and then uh, finally to design the uh, assistive device. So this is another uh, assistive, de assistive device to transfer some person from one place to another, um, <coughs> from chair to the wheelchair or to the restroom. And it has two degrees of freedom, height and uh, rotation. Even though it's a very uh, low degrees of freedom, only two, but it's uh, the motion is trajectory, you have the infinity of possibilities. So, how to, so we try to, for example, um, <coughs> uh, accommodate the trajectory according to the state of the, 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 the user. 
So we integrate the, this device as a robot inside the human digital human model, and then um, <coughs> uh, make some uh, load estimation map according to the different rotation and height, and then uh, plan a trajectory based on some optimization. So uh, depending on uh, the status of the, uh, the user, uh, for example, if you are <coughs> pain at the knee, um, so the first you lift up and then move. So this uh, motion can be different according to the, to, the, to the user, which means it can be personalized or customized according to the user. So finally, I move to the uh, basic theory and ongoing project. So uh, optimization technique, model-based optimization, is very useful to synthesize the uh, very complex motion. So this is uh, mouse contact motion of human robot. The human robot um, goes in, in between the table and stair and it sits down. So the, param the trajectory are parameterized by several methods like spline, and then you set the cost here, torque or smoothness of the trajectory, and also uh, existing time. Of course, you have the constraint on joint, and also torque limit. And also, uh, for the human, especially, you need to think about cost of the balance. Uh, the, the, the good point or strength of the, this method is you can uh, add different types of uh, constraints to see what could be, what, what, <coughs> what happens if you have different types of uh, criteria or constraints. So here we added um, fixed knee uh, constraints or some sore knee constraints. Your knees, your knee are very painful so you don't, you, you want to fix it for example. And also uh, you, you have <coughs> Uh, twisted your foot, so you want to reduce the um, weight applied on your left left foot. So the outcome output of the optimization is like this. So it, it's not natural, but it is uh, working. So for the lock knee a uh, constraints, as you can uh, expect, it makes some uh, swinging motion. Left leg is swings on the outside uh, according to the, the left one. And for the soft foot, in the soft foot case, so you can see that this kind of very uh, interesting motion that it uses upper body to reduce the weight applied at the <coughs> left foot. So uh, by measuring the forces applied at the left neck for the sore foot constraint, you can see that upper body to reduce the up, uh, weight applied at the left foot. So the trajectory optimization is very powerful. So in general, it can, it, it, it <coughs> this uh, optimization, in this optimi optimization, you minimize the cost subject to some uh, constraint. And then uh, your trajectory can be uh, modeled or parameterized by spline, like uh, the param uh, by some parameterized curve. And uh, physical quantities are used to to set set up the cost function, uh, link joint position, aspiration, or, or forces. But <coughs> if your optimization problem becomes complex, uh, you need to make you need to do a very complex um, uh, gradient gradient computation. So uh, um, we try to extend uh, this optimization, especially to compute the gradient in an analytical manner. So I don't go into the detail, but um, we uh, come up with uh, what we call comprehensive motion transformation matrix. This is to extend your Jacobian equation um, to uh, not only the not only the uh, the velocity but also acceleration and other higher order of derivatives. 
So uh, um, this is kind of extension of the homogeneous or spatial uh, transformation matrix. So your uh, velocity vector is extended to the uh, higher order of the derivative of the joint angle and also <coughs> joint angle and velocity. Then we can extend for the higher order co computation of the Jacobian. And then you can, for example, uh, compute the torque Jacobian against the, um, <coughs> the ZMP, for example. So one application is the persistent exciting trajectory optimization. Uh, it is very uh, common that in the in industrial robots, you excite the, the joint motions to identify the physical parameters like mass or center of mass or inertia. So in this case, we want to do it uh, with for humanoids, but uh, not uh, unlike the fixed um, industrial robot, uh, you need to take into account, for example, balance uh, constraint. And also, uh, this is a very complex optimization problem, but by applying the, uh, the, the, the method, the, the framework that I introduced in, uh, previously, um, here uh, we optimize the, what we call condition number, con condition number of regression matrix. Uh, this uh, condition number uh, corresponds to the, the um, performance of the correctness of the, the identification. Then uh, we see this is the uh, output of the uh, this uh, exciting motion. The motion is not very exciting, but uh, it excites the joints, and it can reduce the uh, number of the uh, condition number uh, drastically according to the previous method. So far, so uh, challenges. Uh, <coughs> uh, there are still many challenges. So, so far, so I made some uh, uh, work on the reproducing human motion and product design and uh, some um, gradient uh, different dynamics for optimization. So, but this is far, far from what we want to do. Uh, finally, there are many challenges. So there are many open problems. Uh, maybe a beyond the model-based approach. Maybe a going to with the learning. So, for example, uh, retargeting contact with motions, understanding what is underlying uh, motion strategy. So we can reproduce what we can measure, but if, for example, the environment changes, what happens? So we need to understand underlying motion strategy. And uh, synthesizing, anticipating, and machine learning usage. So uh, I moved to uh, AIST, my former uh, institute, to another university. So fortunately, I could get uh, funding to start up. Uh, this is the public funding from uh, uh, the organization called JSPS. So uh, the I call I, I see I see this proje project CT uh, Cyber Physical Human. So data driven learning, uh, prediction and generation of whole body contact motions based on cyber physical human model. So this is just started. So I don't have I can't show the result yet. But uh, in this project, <coughs> first I want to do some general dynamics description, and then uh, try to uh, do s to see what could be the uh, network between the con uh, complex contact motions, and then going to the symbolify the motion. So to do this, uh, the <coughs> work that we did about the analytical derivative could be very useful because just putting the very complex measured contact motion to the learning system, maybe it's still it's difficult to solve. But by <coughs> applying, for example, um, this method to identify some smaller sets of the, the important uh, parameters or values, feature bar values uh, that describe the dynamic system. We can use uh, inverse optimal control, for example. And then 
this uh, analytical derivative could be the bridge to connect this uh, complex dynamics, dynamics between uh, with the, the um, machine learning. And then uh, now uh, the, the motion, the table motion you saw, that was the, the contact uh, sequence have been run manually, but we don't, we, we want to do it automatically. So, and also in the higher level by using some symbol, you ask the robot to go there or ask the robot to ask the system to, ident to, to annotate the very painful uh, motion capture system, capture the motion in the motion capture system. So this is my, my dream, but uh, I don't know I, to which extent I can achieve, but I want to uh, go still doing some challenges. So thank you for your attention. So I like to uh, go on challenges with the humanoids combined with the uh, uh, digital human. And uh, I just moved, so collaboration is welcome. And uh, some small advertisement, so uh, I'm looking for uh, postdoctoral researchers for the new project. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Hello, Professor. I only have a small question. So you also mentioned about the contact and in the work of uh, making ro human ro uh, humanoid robots to learn how to pick up a box. So uh, I was wondering whether it is only in kinematic uh, motion level. In other words, does it only require the humanoid to mimic the motion of human? But because picking up a box also requires uh, some force applied to the box. So I was wondering, in that part of work, uh, did you consider about the force? Yeah, uh, you mean the force? Yeah, the contact force when yeah, they... Yeah. So this is uh, coming, uh, maybe this may be ad addressed in the upcoming project, uh, because now uh, we, uh, we consider only the motion, and then maybe by parameterizing the box lifting motion, you can uh, do some, uh, you can adapt to the different box, but if the box, uh, is, for example, too heavy. In the current method, it's, it's difficult to uh, adapt. So uh, in the future project, I'd like to introduce force, uh, also force measurement in, in, the, in the system of retargeting. I see. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, professor, very nice talk. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question in terms of uh, locomotion plus manipulation. So where do you see those local manipulators like in five years or 10 years going to be integrated more? Is it going to be in hospital, uh, household, or is it going to be more industrial integrated like in warehouses? Yeah, thank you. So uh, local manipulation is a very important topic. And uh, it also uh, involves the very uh, con the many contacts. So uh, the, the limitation of the, this kind of um, uh, retargeting is uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not very good at now uh, handling these contacts. So uh, I'd like to extend it. So not yet, but I think it is an important uh, topic and I, I'd like to address in the future, my, uh, in my future uh, research. Thank you. Thank you for a nice talk, and I have a question regarding your work on the 2015 on EMBC, which uh -huh. is about the parameterizing the motion human uh, body shape. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me about the SMPA from the Max Planck Institute. So mm -hmm. could you talk, uh, could you summarize a bit about what is the big difference between the another model, which is a SMPA? that also tries to parameterize the human body, like uh, some shape or height or volume, something like that. What is a, can you compare the, that 
your work and others? I, I think this, pr uh, this principally, it is not that different. Mm -hmm. uh, here is one is uh, um, to we add the another axis of age, mm -hmm. and oh, also okay. um, try to uh, try to estimate the force, uh, okay. in force interaction, uh -huh. and to estimate uh, how much force mm -hmm. is applied mm -hmm. when you use or put the human on this kind of devices. Mm -hmm. Then in that case, then the, is that the model is publicly available? Is we can yeah, download the, the model? The, the, yeah. the shaping, shaping model is uh -huh. uh, based on the previous work. Ah, okay. Yeah. okay. Shape, shape uh, scanning method. I think this is a normal scanning method. Ah, okay. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have another question to follow up on the last one. Um, first, thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you. It's an exciting area of research. Um, I believe with the simple body, they have used the Caesar data set, which had like 4,000 body scans or something, mm. quite a lot of them, maybe even more. Uh, your slide had said there was 20 or 80. Did you use the same scans as Caesar, or did you add more scans, 3D scans to yours um, with the age? Uh, in AIST, the former uh, institute I belong to, they had a, a digital human research center. So they have dedicated team to measure different types of humans. So uh, they measure the elderly, the bodies of elderly people and add it in the previous data set. Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's great. I would love to check that out because okay. I've only worked with the other one, which is okay. very limited in, the, okay. in, in terms of age, and that was a, a limitation in my yeah. thesis work. So no, I, I, I'll see if it's available, but uh, this is an additional measurement. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for your nice talk. So I have a question for the digital twin and the physical, physical twin. These two concepts you just mentioned. So I wonder because a lot of research currently is based on the simulation. So it seems that the digital twin is enough for carry out a lot of experiments. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the physical twin has more advantages compared with the digital twin? Yeah. So it is painful to do uh, research in the real world, but you can't simulate everything. So there are still uh, re many researches on the sim to real, and you have uh, problems on that. So I think it is important to have the, some closer look to improve your model by using the, exp the physical twin, then measure and then improve your model, simulation model, to make it closer to the real world. I think uh, you can achieve certain amount, certain level by using only simulation, but real world is not that easy <laughs> also. So I think uh, uh, real world experiment is also important. So I see this kind of importance of the physical world. Yeah. Rashid, Rashid, Rashid. <laughs> You, 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 it was very interesting, and you cover a number of aspects. My question is linked to: Have you worked? Or are you planning to to extend? Well, to use essentially your models for human-robot physical interaction. Yeah. I mean, assisting humans, etc. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. So that's why I included contact in the the upcoming project. So uh, reproducing the project trajectory is. It's really difficult, but I like to really uh, integrate contact. And then uh, it could be also um, useful to ha what, what kind of uh, force interaction is appropriate to for smoother uh, interaction between robot and human. So I think this is a good, very good point. And UA is uh <laughs> uh, working on this aspect, so yeah. <coughs> No, so we uh, only measure the, the force applied 
uh, force generated by pin. Then uh, you compare with and without, and then you see the difference. So maybe we, the model could be better if you can measure the in interaction force between the device and the, the, uh, the body, but it's not that easy. So we try to compare with and without, and how much uh, Newton meter has been generated. Yeah, uh, sorry. So uh, this you use uh, inertial sensor, the okay. IMU, and and also the beacon. Beacons to the some uh, to <coughs> some uh, uh, sensor to detect the position, and also uh, what we call pedestrian uh, depth rating system. This is kind of uh, using the IMU of your smartphone uh, to uh, estimate your traject walking trajectory. Yeah, yeah. And then we combine them to correct sometimes because there is a diversion. So when you use uh, nonlinear optimization, then uh, there are always problems with local minima. Is this, uh, do you need to address this? Do you get different results with? Uh, different starting points and so on. Yeah, so, yeah, we suffer from this kind of problem. So this is one example, but uh, by uh, integrating this uh, analytical deri de derivative, the uh, computation could be more efficient. So uh, for the trajectory optimization, it's kind of almost uh, global optimal, but when you do want it to make it uh, applied in the Real time, of course, we we need to solve this kind of local minima problem. So maybe here I have a last question. You mentioned in, in the last talk how you have been testing uh, this basic theory, right? Yeah. Um, so and you said you said some ideas in theory was was part of this basic theory. So. Yeah, what I, are yeah, okay. yeah, I think uh, uh, we can uh, do some optimization, but I think the ant to anticipate the future, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, maybe you have a model predict control, but uh, anticipating the future, uh, we I think we need some more uh, effort to uh, estimate or uh, <coughs> to predict your future motion. I don't know what, what is necessary. Maybe uh, that in that case, data, data could be interesting. Ah. Hi. Okay. Thank <laughs> <you>. <laughs> One last question. <laughs> um, thanks for the uh, for the talk, and I also wanted to thank you for uh, advocating for model-based optimization. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing that I was thinking about is uh, we're using human human models, right? And uh, you have also mentioned about like collecting data for aging. Uh, do you think there's the need of separating, for example, for ethnicity? Uh, you know, for Separate, some separating for ethnicity, uh, for, sen uh. for example, uh, I think in some mm, cases I don't know if there's evidence about like Asians versus. Mm. Uh, white uh, people, is there any difference in, for example, in how they age? Is there something like that that should be taken into account into this kind of human models? Oh, I, I don't know. So maybe it's better, first we need to collect it. <laughs> maybe it's in that case, it, 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 it is interesting to ha have this kind of different uh, ethnic, ethnic, uh, ethnic aspect of the data. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.